of all, uh, I would just like to introduce uh, the panel. We have David Ring. He is the owner of Ring Farms. Richard P., the Director of Human Resources at Memorial Hospital. Matt Scheich, right? Just like Mike. Got that. Matt Scheich, National Credit Manager, Meyer Distributing. And Susan Remke, uh, People Services at Jasper Engines. So today's pur the purpose of this panel today is we're going to highlight the opportunities and the pathways in the regions young people can pursue after high school and looking at how we can lead success in the workforce. So the first part of it is, is that I'm going to ask each of you to introduce yourselves and your company and provide us with an overview of the range of opportunities that you have within your company and describe a various pathway or credential necessary to be qualified for those jobs. So introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about what brings you here today or maybe your career path, and then also that range of opportunities within your company. Thank you. Um, I hope so. Can everybody hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, uh, as she said, I'm here to represent Meyer Distributing and Meyer Logistics. Uh, we're based here in Jasper, Indiana. Um, we're an aftermarket distributor primarily of uh, automotive parts, but um, we have now reached uh, critical mass in being all in all 48 states on our own fleet. Uh, we have about 2 million square feet of warehousing that we use to facilitate uh, the products through our network and uh, we're looking at other opportunities outside of automotive um, the next fastest horse as we say uh, to try to find other opportunities uh, the one good thing about uh, warehousing and logistics is it's a, a series of professions associated with it it's not uh, a job that can be exported um, these are tangible jobs here um, that cannot be moved to China we all need goods and services and we need people to move them around so um, like I said, we're looking at alternatives and other things to get into outside of automotive. Um, but uh, primarily, this is our home office. The, the business was started here. Um, a vast majority of our uh, opportunities are with truck driving, um, facilities management, um, working in our warehouses, uh, sales staff, um, and uh, some, other, some other jobs. But as big as our company has become and as complicated as many people would see it, it's actually pretty simple. Um, our core competency is to get goods and products to people and repeat the process and don't make mistakes. So uh, we actually have a very narrow range of, of jobs that we have in the company for as big as we are. So um, there are many different pathways to these different jobs. Um, obviously a post-secondary four-year uh, education and things like accounting, um, finance, human resources are important, but we also have a, a lot of opportunities and a lot of high paying opportunities that don't require a four year degree, uh, such as truck driving. Uh, we've been working very hard with some resources here in the community, primarily uh, Dubois Strong and uh, Vincennes University Jasper to try to get a truck driver training school going here. Uh, the closest is Vincennes, Evansville, Indianapolis, and uh, Vincennes University does have a program that we're trying to get a satellite program going here. Uh, all the pieces of that are in place. Uh, we're just currently searching for an instructor, both for the classroom and for the driver setting. So I figured I would use this opportunity to, to plug that for everybody in case anybody knows somebody that'd be interested in that job. If they do, the person to contact would be Ed Cole. Uh, he would be able to direct you in the right way. So. Vincennes has used that program in uh, Plainfield in Indianapolis to work inside of the high school students. Um, truck drivers are the number one employed job in 38 out of 50 states, and I think it's number two in 11 out of the next 12 states. So uh, the average age of a CDL driver, I believe, is 54 or 55 years old. So it's a uh, cycle that kind of is in lockstep with the baby boomers, and there's going to be a very drastic shortage of truck drivers and when there's a drastic shortage of anything prices go up so that means very high paying jobs um, for people that are interested in, in driving tractor trailers so um, that's a broad scope of who we are and kind of what I'll be talking about and I'll pass it along. Thank you. Hello my name is Susan Rimke and as um, it was stated I'm the people services representative for Jasper Engines. I'm actually located in our Crawford County facility. 
Um, Jasper is a company that is innovative and always on the move. We have over 3,000 associates nationwide, coast to coast. Um, locally, we have about 1,200 in our Jasper, Indiana plant. Uh, we have about 465 in our Crawford County location. Um, and we have 42 branches across the nation that house the rest of our um, owner associates. Um, we're looking for 10% annual growth. We want to be the employer of choice, the brand of choice, and through that process, we're going to need additional associates. And one of the things about Jasper that makes us unique, as I'm sure if you're local, you're aware, that there was a company started by Alvin C. Ruxer. That company was then passed on to the Bobble and Schwank families, and then about seven years ago, the Bobble and the Schwank families sold that company to us, the associates, and they loaned us the money to buy it from them. Now, if there's any finance people in the crowd, you know that just does not happen naturally. Um, so when you become part of our family, you also become an owner of your own company. So you are driving your own future. You own your future. We remanufacture, so we take the broken down, greasy, grimy, nasty engine, transmission, drive train component that doesn't work, we bring it back in-house, and when it leaves, it's better than the original OEM uh, qualification. So we've warranted that. It's got a three-year uh, warranty on it. So it is a product that people put their trust into. So during that process and this growth that we're looking for, we're definitely going to need more owners, shareholders, that want to call Jasper Engines their home. So we're 3,000 strong. And that is from accounting to marketing to IT to um, over-the-road drivers. We have the same struggle as you have. Um, nursing. We have on-site health and wellness centers. So they have nurse practitioner, nurses, lab techs, CMAs. Um, you can go to the doctor right on your lunch break at Jasper Engines of either one of our southwestern Indiana facilities. So we're looking to staff those types of positions also. And Oh yeah, we also need people in manufacturing. So that's also a small part of, it, part of that. We are a large, we are one family. So as we're looking for those career and pathways, we want, we have a lot of talent in this area. And that talent is young, some of that. So if, as a recruiter, if I can come to you and say, educational facilities, whether that's high school, secondary, post-secondary, you're my number one recruiting source. We are a win-win for each other. We can help each other and work together and not only improve what we're doing, we can improve our community together. So it's important that we continue to build those partnerships. Um, so that's what we are, who we are, and what we're looking for. And we're interested in your students from this person who wants to come to work tomorrow. They graduate one day, want to come part of the family. We like, there's, we have positions that require a certi uh, certificate, maybe a welding, those types. We have a lot of two-year automotive people that work with us. We also have four and six-year degreed college students too. Um, so I always want everybody to think more of us than just the people that remanufacture engines. We have a lot of career opportunities under our roof. Thank you. Great, thanks. I'm Rich Peake, Director of Human Resources at Memorial Hospital. We service about eight different counties around, um, and, and healthcare really is, is evolving and changing. Um, I think in about five years ago, we had a, a workforce of about 14, just over 1,400, and now we are pushing the 1,700 mark in five years. So with that addition, uh, we, we have a, a large, um, I, I, I'd like to say the perfect storm coming up, especially in the nursing programs. Um, we have uh, some numbers that I have here is by 2018 we're going to see about 22 percent increase in needs of work of nurses and nurses as you just heard uh, Susan say we're competing with with manufacturing now we're competing with education we're competing with um, a, a multitude of different uh, uh, organizations that you wouldn't necessarily think of but you compound that with the baby boomer gener generation that's also going to be taking uh, more advantage of our health care. We, we continue to have to evolve in what we do. We're looking for students um, for our CNA program. We're, we're becoming very creative on how we do that. We, we know that in a CNA program, uh, one of the barriers for, for people to get into that is the $1,000 the cost. 
well, as a healthcare, we will actually fund that up front now. Uh, CMAs, RNs, of course, physicians. But, but interesting enough, we're, we're also competing for industrial maintenance people that most people wouldn't think of. We're competing for uh, individuals that know how to, to look at blueprints, to, that know how to uh, robotics, pneumatics, those types of things. So we, we also have, of course, the IT. So there's a whole plethora of, of industry in de demands that we have from a healthcare program. And uh, with that, we, we need those certified individuals. We need those individuals with RNs, uh, bachelor degrees. We are pushing all of ours uh, in the next five years to become BSN. Uh, so, so that's a, another demand on, on our colleges. But we have the, the whole gamut of educational needs for a healthcare facility. Great, thank you. I'm David Ring. I live uh, just out by Hangberg Airport. When uh, Brad Ward at that time was the head of the Community Foundation called me up in December, I think, to, to do this, I said, <laughs> I'm going to talk about Ring Farms, but I'll talk about the agricultural environment in Dubois County, which is, uh, I think, really huge. A little bit about, I uh, graduated from college, taught business for 10 years, and I had to get killed in a car wreck, and I was out of education, went back in 93, I think, or 94. At, Southridge is the vocational ag instructor, so I was uh, right down my alley where I wanted to be, uh, talk about things. Um, <clears throat> Dubois County is uh, uh, very populated with agriculture. I did a uh, presentation for Dubois County Strong a couple months ago, and I researched the number of people employed in direct production of agriculture. I'm talking Dubois County, sorry about these other counties, but, but uh, 6,300 people plus involved in direct production of agriculture in Dubois County. So talk about jobs, there's a lot of potential there for different areas. Um, I guess um, <clears throat> before I go on, I'm the, I'm the ch uh, CGO of Ring Farms, which is the chief gopher officer, uh, but uh, I guess that's an important job too. Um, Dubois County is uh, number one in ag sales in the state of Indiana. Uh, we're also number one in turkey production. We kind of hit the map uh, a couple weeks ago on a little problem, uh, avian flu. Uh, hopefully that thing's been resolved. Um, we have a very vibrant uh, <coughs> ag economy. Uh, as you drive down the road, you see the implement dealers. Uh, used to, uh, if you had somebody in your family worked for an implement dealer, they came home at night, uh, oil soaked, grease all over them, everything else. Uh, in today's world, it doesn't quite work like that. Um, when you leave, if you drive past Hof Equipment, we'll plug in for them, um, and see those uh, big tractors sitting there, um, you're talking probably five hundred to $600,000 for each one of those things. Uh, very high tech, and, and uh, the, uh, the crunch is for them to find somebody that will that can work on these things, and it's it's probably a two-year program because um, you know they want someone that they can bring in and train also. The uh, uh, technology part is is what I think is really going to step forward in the ag community in Dubois County and other surrounding counties also. Uh, we have uh, equipment that has uh, auto steer. We have uh, it paints a map of everything. If you're pulling some kind of piece of equipment that shows what you've done. Uh, those things are great, but guess what? It's electronics. And uh, we had a tractor that has a CV2 transmission in it, and it wasn't shifting right, so we called Blushes in Holland. They sent uh, a guy out, he gets in the seat with his laptop, plugs it in the console, drives it here to the parking lot, turns around, comes back, and says, well, it's fixed. So, you know, I mean, that's, that's where agriculture is gonna, gonna need, uh, need this. I will compliment our schools. We have four very good ag programs in our schools. I have to be a little bit biased to Southridge. I taught uh, vocational agriculture there for 16 years. And I retired about five or six years ago. Mr. Einemann had a sigh of relief when I quit, I guess. But, but, um, <laughs> but uh, Heritage Hills has a good program also. Uh, we talked about work-based uh, uh, programs. We had two people so far we've employed and they've gone on. Uh, one of them, when he started working as a freshman in high school, I don't think he knew the difference between a cow and a pig. And uh, he went to Western Kentucky and majored in agri-science. And we have another one that uh, worked for us, and he went to uh, Wobbe 
Wabash College in Illinois, I think that's right. Anyway, he's uh, majoring in agri-science, or ag agronomics, uh, horticulture, and all these other things. So, which brings up another point, horticulture is a big uh, thing. Uh, Southridge has a uh, really nice uh, greenhouse. They have a horticulture program, I think. Botch Jaspers, are you in horticulture there too, aren't you, a little bit? Okay. <laughs> but, but you know, those are the programs that are available for our ag students. And uh, when I was teaching, I promoted the two-year programs. Uh, like I think somebody said this morning, uh, not every student should go to a four-year college. Uh, some people just, you know, that's just not their thing. And uh, they can come out like, uh, I have, a, interrupting here a second, I have a lot of hope for my future because uh, Mr. Allen and Mr. Sigbert back there, were uh, ag teachers and they move on to superintendent and assistant principal so you know there's I guess there's hope for everybody if you're an ag teacher but uh, you know the uh, the programs have a lot of a uh, lot of possibilities I think in our our county all right thank you so the next question is what are the greatest workforce needs uh, that you currently have, and we, we've kind of touched base on these just a bit, but let's let's delve into it just a bit deeper. Um, what are you finding as the biggest challenge to f you're facing to to fill these workforce needs? So, what's your challenge, and what's some of the barriers? I think we're a little bit different. We would be more similar to Jasper Engines in the fact that we have locations outside of Jasper. Um, I think. The biggest problem facing all of us locally here is just a, a low supply of labor. Um, we're the, chronically the lowest unemployment county in the state, um, and there are no specific figures on the local cities, but I, I would venture to say Jasper is probably at 1% or below. So um, stability in the workforce is a problem. So one big thing is we need more people to, to move here. We need to promote the county, we need to promote the cities which I think a lot of organizations locally are doing a wonderful job at. Um, we need to talk to more students about opportunities that are available to them. Um, even if they have the intentions of going on to a two or a four year degree, what's to stop them from maybe working for a couple of years to try to figure things out? So um, the four year degree is a great pathway, um, but maybe not immediately after school. <clears throat> a lot of kids have never lived outside of the county. Some kids have never traveled outside of the state. Um, so there's nothing wrong with working before you kind of find out what your own pathway is. So locally is just the supply of workforce. Um, I would say I touched on a, another specific and that's truck drivers. Uh, that, that's going to get much, much, much worse. Um, there's about a 35,000 driver shortage nationally now, um, but the average age of a CDL driver is 55 years old. So there's going to be tens if not hundreds of thousands of people retiring in that profession over the next five to ten years. Um, and there's some estimates that predict that, that shortage to be up to 250,000 people. So um, I do know that uh, when we were speaking with VU, VUJC about the truck driver training program that's going on in Indianapolis, they're trying to actually work their way into the Indianapolis public school system um, where that's a vocational training like welding or nursing um, where the students can get certification and classroom work out of the way. Uh, one of the drawbacks is, is that there is federal law that requires people to be 21 years old to hold a Class A CDL and drive across state lines, um, but you can drive within the state as long as your insurance company will cover it. So those are a few. I, I think the, the next biggest, which would apply to all of our locations and all of our professions, is the understanding and the adoption of technology. Um, and I don't just kind of pigeonhole that into someone in their late 40s or 50s who's changing careers and has to be retrained and doesn't understand new technology. It, it's all ages. And uh, we, we use a lot of technology to create efficiencies in our company. Um, and, you know, it's a problem for some people because it's just overwhelming at the pace at which we work. So um, more technology education is needed um, in communities through certification programs, community colleges, and in high schools. Um, I think one of the, the biggest areas um, that I would touch on in terms of that is mathematics is great. I was great at math. Um, I excelled at it, but math can be boring. Um, and I think we, we need to find a way to take mathematics and translate that into problem solving 
where we take real world examples um, and put that towards the students so they're not just chronically doing formulas, but they're actually taking world, real world situations and applying that math that they can learn in high school. Um, the, the parallel to that is computer programming. Computer programming is a language, but it's also a math. It requires logic. So I, I think one of the biggest opportunities here locally um, in the schools is potentially to start creating at a middle school or high school level computer programming. Um, specifically SQL um, or SQL and C and C sharp. Um, we, we are moving into the 21st century and technology is going to touch everything. There's millions and millions of devices um, that are connected and there's hundreds of devices in this room and we need to have that as part of the high school training. Um, we had 15 people that knew how to code in those computer languages. <clears throat> We'd hire them today either on an internship basis while they computed completed their education or um, full time. So just brief overview. And I'm going to piggyback what he said. One of the our greatest need is over the road drivers. I currently have six openings and I can spend thousands of dollars on ads and absolutely not get the first application. Um, so it's definitely a challenge for anyone that wants to move product from point A to point B. Um, another area that we um, have sometimes have to search long and hard for is the informational technology or that IT degree. One of the things that I feel as a company, and I might be a little biased, that we're doing well is that partnership with our local um, high schools. And I'm going to use Perry Central for an example um, in Harrison County and Tell City. They came to us and they shared with us um, what their work ethic program was going to look like. And if you're looking at that, that's what employers were looking for, 98% attendance. I don't know an employer out there that wouldn't just think that is just rock solid and you have a job. That's one of the hardest things we have is we hired you because we need you. Oh yeah, we expect you to come to work every day on time and all day. You know, there you have to learn contingency planning. You know, I might need to go, um, my favorite is I need to go to the doctor, I need off. Do you have an appointment? No. You know what, come back at lunch, you can use my phone or use the one in your pocket and let's get an appointment first, then let's schedule time off in advance. So that learning how to problem solve just everyday situations that come up. So through that work ethic program, they have needed to do community service. Um, they have to have the rock solid attendance. They have to be organized. They have to be able to sit through an interview. So as a company, we looked at that program and we're like, wow, we want these kids. Why don't we can have them in an internship while they go through school? We'll just take them right out of school and put them to work. And, but we're competing against all these guys and everybody else for that same population of workers. So we came together as a, as a company and we have our work ethic review criteria. So over a period of three years, if those behaviors continue, the attendance, to being flexible to change the understanding, being able to communicate verbally and not just through your device, having a face-to-face -face conversation, then we're going to be, as a company, investing in your future. We're going to give that child $33,450 over the course of three years. At the end of the three years, they got a little more cash in their pocket. We have an A player on our team and probably, hopefully, someone that we have developed through this process that's going to be the next generation of leader. So it's a win-win. The child wins, the school system wins, Jasper Engine wins, and so does the community. So when I started writing down all the list of things that we were doing that we're trying to partner with the people in this room, we have our CAP program through Vincent's University. So where when they graduate with a two-year technical degree, they have some work experience under their belt, and they have that low um, expense for going to college because it helps pay for that. Um, we love to have your students in our building. We want them in here. Um, as Jody French uh, mentioned, we are now going into Sean Reese's higher education class. I was there this week. Great gr group of kids. Can't wait to go back. So we're planting that seed early of what we need for what they need to be successful. Because if, we're in, if we don't partner, nobody's going to be successful. So right now we're looking at these on the manufacturing side. But as we grow this opportunity, we want that IT student 
I, at 18, you want to be an over-the-road driver? What are we going to do with you from 18 to 21? Because you have to be 21 because we're going to need you to go across state line. So how do we get that child, that student, into the Jasper family and we mold them and raise them till they're ready to go at 21? So those are the things that we need your help with, and those are our struggles. Um, we're fortunate. We live in an area that unemployment is not an issue. Now, the county that I live in or reside in every day, that the, high, the employment rate is higher. I still have those same struggles of finding somebody that wants to come to work every day, all day, has a care about the product, cares about customer service, and wants to be an owner of their company. So when we can put those soft skills and we start young and build pride in what they're doing, we're going to all be more successful. So any, any partnership that we can have with you, we're definitely, our door's open and we're ready to talk. I'm probably gonna talk a little bit about more about nursing um, because I, I think you heard me say earlier, um, you know, the, the demand's gonna continue to grow our um, our licenses that we uh, the mandates that we have to have continue to change. Uh, years ago, an LPN and working in a hospital was uh, pretty common. We've moved that to an ASN then, and now we're at a BSN. So that continues. Uh, you you get out in the field. Our our basic EMTs have evolved where we really need paramedics out there now. So so we continue to increase the skill levels we need. Another big challenge that we have is we are a 24-7 operation. It's not like we can close down and go home. We need individuals that are going to work evenings, nights, and weekends. A lot of people don't want to do that anymore. Um, we have a very mobile workforce. Uh, you wouldn't think uh, the things that are going on in Evansville affects Jasper, Indiana, but it does. Uh, whenever Owensboro opens up a new hospital, they're pulling a lot of workforce from Evansville. Evansville then continues to pull a lot of workforce from us. We have individuals that are willing to, to, to work to travel 30 miles. I, I have to say I travel an hour every day to work. And so we have a very mobile workforce and, and that continues to change uh, our recruitment needs. Uh, when, when we increase our pay scale um, to keep up, Evansville increases theirs. So it's, it's a constant battle um, that, that we are that we're fighting. We, um, we invest in our, in our employees. We, we have tuition uh, reimbursement. We have scholarship programs where we'll actually pay them a certain percentage as they, they go to school um, so they can maintain their health insurance benefits. We're becoming very creative on how we can continue to invest in our workforce um, and, and meet the, the demands of health care as it continues to change. I think that uh, I know the county high schools and Heritage Hills has a very outstanding uh, egg program and it's an exposure thing for them um, exposing these uh, students to to feed our field um, it's a little bit different you know you're a lot of times outdoors working with animals and that are greatly appeals to, to a lot of people um, and uh, I think that uh, these programs are probably the best feed for a workforce that, uh, that the, the uh, career of agriculture can provide. Um, talked about technology a while ago. I, I have to relate something. I, was, uh, I flew to a meeting uh, a couple months ago when I was on a plane and got to talking to the person beside me and I said I was a dairy farmer from Indiana and the first thing uh, this person did was looked at my hands. Um, I could tell they glanced out my hands like I'd milk these cows by hand night and morning, you know. My mom and dad did, but I don't, I won't, but anyway, uh, in that same vein, uh, probably many of you have not heard about, uh, there's a lot of uh, trends toward robotic milkers. Um, you now you talk about technology, uh, that, that's technology, and uh, nobody has to be around. The cows walk in their own free will, get milked, have a good day come back whenever you're feeling a little tight and uh, you get get it so uh, but I think our workforce is being helped greatly by uh, by our ag programs in our high schools great so we have a unique panel um, you know we have logistics and advanced manufacturing ag and health care so what I'm hearing is still technology keeps rising to the top right um, so with that, um, the next question is, and, and some of you have hit on this a bit, 
But what does a successful candidate for employment look like for you? I'm going to touch on that point real quick and then make a quick couple other points. Uh, I think four key things for us are what was mentioned before, and that's reliability. Are you going to show up to work? Are you vested? Are you invested? Are you interested? Are you going to be here every day? Can we count on you? Um, are you open-minded? Things are changing very fast around you. What we may teach you today may change tomorrow, so you have to be open-minded to change. Uh, something very related to that is also being positive. Um, thinking positively and, and just not coming to work with a negative attitude is, is a big deal because it rubs off on other people. And I think the fourth thing is problem solving. And it gets back to, you know, when I was talking about mathematics, computer skills, um, programming, um, the ability to see the forest through the trees and to not see things as what they may appear to most people and to take that situation and fix it. So. Um, I think that's a real basic um, criteria for people that we look for. Um, I think to tie all this together, I think as a country, I think the hardest thing as a country for us is the ability for us to see how things are going to be and not how once they were. Um, you know, 1945, post-World War II, half the manufacturing of the world was inside the boundaries of the United States. Um, and I hear people all the time in political discussions, sociology discussions, and locally talk about, well, we need to get it to be like that. Well, that was a mirage. It's never going to be like that again. That's a false sense of reality. Um, it's a global economy now, and there's 7 billion people that are competing, um, and you have to be able to see how they are going to be and not how they once were. So I think locally um, for the opportunity within that broader context is that the greatest opportunity that we have around here is supply chain management and logistics and warehousing. I had lunch with the senior vice president of FedEx last week, uh, had lunch with her two years prior and she was just coming up and they come to check on us every once in a while. Uh, we do a lot of business with them, but they also look at us as a tier one competitor um, because of our network. Uh, we only do about 1% of our business with third party freight companies, about 99% of it goes on our own trucks. So they're uh, trying to keep uh, close tabs on us while also looking at us as a customer. They made a huge investment recently. Uh, it was a couple months ago it was announced that they're building a very large facility just north of Evansville. Um, they are also currently in the final uh, construction stages of a huge investment that they have down around Louisville. UPS has their overnight package facility in Louisville. Um, where we're standing right here, the way a crow flies and the way that the DOT rules work is that this is the best spot in the United States for logistics. Um, this is a gold mine. This is a gold rush and people can't see it yet. But over the next 25 years, you're going to see a massive influx of people building warehousing and distribution facilities here um, because you can reach more people in one to two days um, than you can from anywhere else in the country. And it's low taxes, it's cheap land, um, so the biggest thing is preparing our workforce for that and building infrastructure to support it. So as I was making my list of what do we look for in that um, candidate, um, same things that we've been talking about all morning, you know, the flexibility to change. You know, I always tell everybody when they come to, um, once in a while somebody might complain to me. I say, you know, if you're not happy today, just hold your breath because tomorrow it'll be different. We'll figure out a new way to do that. So they have to be open to that change and they have to realize that there's more than one way to successfully complete a task. Um, communication skills, and I touched on it a while ago, I can call somebody for an interview and they won't answer. I can text them and they answer me immediately. I don't know how many are parents of teenagers, but I have that same problem with my sons too, you know. So, you know, they need to have a loyalty to their company, to their co-associate and to the product that they build. They need to understand customer service in that there is a way to say things and a way not to say things and who that customer is. You have internal customers as well as we have external customers. They need to understand that success happens over time. You can't come into an organization and be the boss the next day. You know, you have to understand the culture. You have to be able to live in it before you can lead in that culture to be successful. So they have to understand that success takes time, effort, and teamwork. 
because they're not going to get there by themselves. They can't be a silo. They've got to work with others. And then that problem solving and that critical thinking. You know, when I have a student that comes in and we turn around, we make an offer of employment, and I see him put on that beautiful white Jasper shirt, and I see him sit up like this, I'm like, this one's going to be successful. We've got this guy. He is already proud to have Jasper, and that does makes me feel good, and because we know that there's going to potential for a long-term associate was there. So we need to figure out how do we install that pride in a child, in a student, that what their success is. We need to be sure that if you're, I'm gonna ask you to climb Mount Everest, I don't expect you to get to the top today, but I expect you to make this, and we're gonna celebrate this small joy, this small accomplishment. Because this generation does like immediate gratification. So we have to learn to think like them. We're not going to have them adapt to us. We've tried, it's not working. So we need to figure out how we communicate with them on their level and how we help them be successful. So I think it's the same, you know, as he was saying is that we need them to come to work every day. We need them to have that desire to learn and want to learn and to be part of the team, part of ours. Thank you. I think it's really interesting. My list shadows theirs. <laughs> so we're all looking for the same thing. Um, we, we do need individuals to show up to work. Whenever I have a nurse that's not at that bed, then I have to fill that with another nurse. Um, when I have an open position, um, I, I, I have to fill that with somebody. It's just not a, a question of whether we have someone there or not. It's how we're going to get somebody there. Last year alone, our organization spent $350,000 just on um, temporary staff coming in to work for us. That's just nursing too. So what that means to us is we have an individual at that bedside that, that it doesn't buy into what our mission is. Our mission is most important to us. We survey our workforce on an annual basis to see what needs they need for us to provide to them from a leadership team. The thing that our workforce is most focused on and most important to them is what our mission is. And, and they want to provide that care and that compassion. So that's really what we're looking for. Number two thing that, that our workforce uh, asked for help for this year was how to resolve conflict. And you think that, that that's really an easy one, uh, but it's not. Educating on people on how to communicate with each other whenever there's a challenge. Um, those, those are the types, and, and accountability. They, they want to be held accountable, and, and they want us to hold everybody else accountable. That's what makes a good day for our workforce. And those are the types of things that we're focused on as a leadership team, is to provide an environment that, that our, our workforce wants. It's one thing nice about <clears throat> going last, you can say ditto to whatever they said. <clears throat> I think, <clears throat> excuse me, with agriculture, uh, we were very fortunate to have a wide range of employment possibilities from, <clears throat> excuse me, right out of high school, two-year tech programs to four-year college degrees. It's all available in every county represented here, somewhere in the ag uh, field and career in their, in their in, in the industry. All right. So it looks like that um, we're just about out of time because we do want to leave some time uh, for questions and answers. So <clears throat> very, very quickly, like two or three sentences or less, I do think it's important to share with the group um, how your, your company uh, is able to partner with schools to expose more students to pathways. So if you can just briefly give a short example of how your company uh, has either partnered or would like to partner with schools to make a difference. I think in the essence of time, I'll just repeat what I said earlier. And uh, we have a wonderful institution in VUJC here locally. Um, it gives uh, students the opportunity to get a lot of credits out of the way where they don't have to pay three times the cost at the, at the other states. They can stay home and work. So that being here by default gives every company in the area to actually have a young, energetic workforce to be able to provide them with an internship or learning and life skills through work while they go to school. Uh, and I would just touch back and make the plug on the truck driver training school, which would benefit everybody. Um, and we really need to get that going and then integrate that into the high schools in the county. Thank you. 
All right, I'll just run down my list. We have the work ethic program. We have the CAP program with Vincent University. Uh, we do Jasper Connect, um, where we bring students in most, normally after their first year of college and they do problem solving. They work out on the floor. Kate runs that for us and it's been a very successful program. Job shadowing, junior achievement. Uh, we're providing the subject matter expert into the classes at uh, Perry Central for the higher manufacturing. We're working on having our own version of the summer uh, teacher boot camp to where we want to bring um, local teachers into the, the plant for all their summer vacation. What did I do on my summer vacation? Um, we're looking at, uh, we have advisory members on uh, Harrison County and on Perry Central's higher manufacturing. Uh, we've worked very closely with Glenn Goffnett. Um, and one, one thing I want to say is when you partner with education, you guys tell us how it really is. So if I, you call me about a student, you, Glenn's awesome, he'll say, this is going to knock it out of the park. Or, you know what, he's got some skills. This is what you're going to have to help him understand, coming to work every day or something like that. So we know exactly what that looks like when it walks in the door and what resources we need to help that person be successful. Because once they get in your door, it's all about making them successful. We, uh, we have a uh, summer health care camp that we want to introduce uh, high school students to, uh, all the different opportunities. We actually will bring a, a helicopter in and, and land it so they can see what that looks like. They go throughout the entire aspect of our organization, uh, whether it's the lab, whether it's a nursing, whether it's surgery, and, and they're exposed to a lot of different things. Our, uh, our commitment and, and partnership with HOSA is, is amazing. Uh, to, to tell you that that works, we have about 170 of our workforce members are post-graduates uh, from our HOSA program. So that, I think, tells you all in itself how successful the HOSA program has been for us. We're continuing to develop partnerships there. Um, we actually provide instructors uh, for our uh, EMT program. And so we can, we can also go ahead and, and graduate students uh, with a basic EMT license and we're working right now to develop a CNA program uh, to where we can help uh, educate and, and it's our employees going into the schools and help teach in those classes. Great, thank you. Well, I think agriculture has a unique uh, advantage here. They have a, a very successful ag programs in a, lot, in a lot of schools. If you're here and you do not have an ag program in your school, uh, give me a call, I'll try to help you get one set up because it's important and agriculture is. Uh, <clears throat> we employ a lot of uh, high school kids, we raise 100,000 tom turkeys a year, and if a high school kid can walk down through a house with a 45-pound tom turkey jumping all over them, they, they're pretty hardcore. So we, uh, we, we like that responsibility too. But uh, I think, uh, you know, what everybody said here about uh, dependability, uh, that, is, that is the key to any profession. Uh, be there, if you're supposed to be there at 8 o'clock, be there at 10 till, you know, and, and uh, you know, be very diligent about that. All right, so now we would like to uh, open it up for some questions. We have time probably for a couple. Any questions for the panel? Our job. Yeah, one question. Give me one question. I feel like an auctioneer, but yes, go ahead. Uh, I think you, you mentioned that um, we have to learn to think like they do. I think that's from Jasper Indians. Um, as a principal of a high school, that's one of the hardest things to get people to understand that the clientele that we have right now are different kids. They're, you know, they they do things. What what some of my teachers think there is no way they could be studying. You know, they have earbuds in their ears. They have a phone in their hand. They have you know. How did you get your uh, how did, you, how did you gain that thought that you have to meet them there that we're probably not, it's a whole different bird? I think that's called trial and error. <laughs> um, you know, I th we're, we're, I'm blessed. I work for a company that's innovated and will allow you to try things to see mm -hmm. if, if it works or not. Um, and sometimes it doesn't. But what we found, when you go back and you look at your turnover, which is an ugly word in any kind of business, is that we were missing the mark. We thought we could bring them in in old school, but that's not how they work. That's not how they learn. Um, it took many errors. It took, you know, it had to significantly impact 
somebody else's numbers because at the end of the day we're manufacturing and we have a goal to hit every day and so when that goal doesn't get hit you have to go back and start peeling back the layers of the onion and what we found was uh, we did a lot of the research we did training on generational gaps um, mm -hmm. we took every leadership person through that process and taught them about the generations and how they learned and it was kind of fun because you learned about yourself now right. I know why I like I, why I'm like I am so it was a training process well, I would encourage you as business people to keep reminding schools of that um, we feel I feel very blessed too that on for our business which is the school business which is a high school business but as most of you know, education is uh, very slow to change, okay? We've all, as administrator, I was a teacher too for not quite half of my career so far, which is 30 years, but close to half I was in the classroom. But I can't even compare what happened in the classroom 18 years ago mm -hmm. when I left the classroom. So my 18 years of administration, one of, and maybe some of you other principals in the room are having difficulty, but when, when she said that, you know, we have to meet them there, I'm finding it difficult to convince teachers that we have to meet them there. Even with technology, even with um, for college is not for everybody, you know, the whole thing. So changing, I think as we partner with more and more businesses, we, we had a meeting yesterday with a, a lot of businesses from Davies County, and we're looking at the work ethics program, but looking at a, a very unique pilot program working through about 15 businesses in Davies County. But I just told the business people, we will be as um, transparent as we can because when you tell the schools you're not giving us workable kids, we know that <laughs> because, you know, they don't, they don't have to come to school anymore. There's no seat time. Um, so we get more and more hard-pressed to get them to school. So if you'll just keep reminding the schools, too, that it's okay to change, that the business world is changing to meet the needs of the new generation, and it would be acceptable for us as educators to change as well. There was a, we, we were challenged to watch a TED talk the other day, and the piece in there that I took away from that, whatever long it was, was that this is the generation that we're learning from them. Previously, we have passed down to the next generation, but to be successful, we're gonna have to learn from that four-year-old. We're gonna have to learn from the generations that are below us, or we're not gonna be successful. So, thank you. All right, um, a round of applause. Thank you all for being here today.